distinguished panelists, specially, special invited guests, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this side event entitled Oceans Governance and SIDS Sustainable Development. First, allow me to bring greetings from our Secretary General, Ambassador Irwin Larocque, who is unable to attend the conference, but who sends his personal wishes for successful deliberations at today's side event. We are using this platform as a first step to what we hope will be many engagements between ourselves, the Pacific Island Forum, and the Indian Ocean Commission to advance the SIDS collectivity. I wish to extend my personal thanks to the Pacific Islands Forum and the Indian Ocean Commission for agreeing to be part of this side event and to their delegates for their participation. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, today we are also announcing a major partnership for the wider Caribbean region in the form of the UNDP GEF Caribbean Large Marine Ecosystem Project or CLME Plus. Without going into too much detail, this project is a tangible demonstration of some of the principles we are going to discuss today. I cannot stress how important the issue of oceans governance is to our region. For us, it is more than just a buzzword. In CARICOM, it speaks to enhance economic opportunities for our people, as well as effective management of our vulnerable resources. The CLME Plus project is a tangible manifestation of the importance we afford to the record to this issue. I therefore urge you to listen and to participate, and of course, feel free to follow up with us after the event. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Omar Figueroa, Minister of State, Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Forestry, the Environment, Sustainable Development, and Climate Change, a real super minister. <laughs> Government of When we consider that the world's ocean cover approximately 71% of the planet's surface, with an estimated volume of 1,335 billion cubic kilometers, it is understandably difficult to grasp how effective governance could possibly be achieved for such immense resources. To discuss the governance of the oceans, we must contemplate its resources, its services, and its uses. We must also come to terms with the fact that the oceans are altogether one impressive ecosystem, and as such, we are challenged to think beyond state-centric structures of governance. Small island developing states have much to tell of the complex but vital relationships we share with the waters that surround our islands. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, our oceans and seas define us. They demarcate the borders of our small islands and low-lying coastal states. They enrich our cultures and tradition. They nurture us and drive our green and blue economies. As much as we depend on the oceans and seas, the oceans and seas depend on us to ensure their health and their resilience. As is well documented in the Barbados Program of Action, the Mauritius strategy for its implementation, and the Samoa pathway, SIDS, together with their regional and international partners, are committed to a number of actions aimed to ensure the sustainability of oceans and seas, including improving the conservation of coastal and marine resources and integrated coastal management, addressing marine pollution through effective partnerships, adopting and implementing effective measures for the long-term sustainable use of fisheries resources, supporting the sustainable development of small-scale fisheries, strengthening disciplines and subsidies in the fisheries sector, and enhancing cooperation at all levels to address the causes of ocean acidification. While some of these commitments can be readily undertaken at the national level, many, if not most, 
require coordinated responses, whether at the regional or international levels. Indeed, these same commitments have been translated into global targets of SDG 14 and are reaffirmed now in the call to action. I wish to stress that compared to other non-SIDS developing countries, these sub-regional, regional and global level interactions are more important to SIDS given our endemic human, institutional and resource constraints. Before we look for a grab bag of international responses, I encourage you to look around. Each of us carry similar burdens, bear similar challenges, and share the same oceans and seas. <coughs> it is therefore in our interest to develop common strategies and take action together. To try my own country as an example, we can continue to do so through the Caribbean community, the wider Caribbean, and globally. In devising common strategies, SIDS should endeavor to make our objectives and needs around ocean sustainability clear. We could even endeavor to take the lead in ocean governance. As the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said in his statement to the Third International Conference on Small Island Developing States, I see SIDS as a magnifying glass. When we look through the SIDS lens, we see the vulnerabilities we all face. And by addressing the issues facing SIDS, we are developing the tools we need to promote sustainable development across the entire world. Ban Ki-moon may have intended these words as a challenge to the international community, but I would like to put that challenge to SIDS. Dare to be bold and lead the way for sustainable solutions to the world's oceans problems. At today's event, we will hear from some of those very leaders from our region who are devising solutions for effective ocean governance. I am sure that we will all benefit from their valuable experiences. I thank you once again for your participation and wish you all the success. Thank you. My task really is to moderate, if I should use that word, the, the remaining session where, of course, having heard of the importance of inter and intra-regional cooperation between our two regions, the Caribbean and the Pacific, we want to be able to demonstrate that across our regions we do have significant indigenous capacity which we need to bring to the attention of the world as we seek to address the issue of ocean governance and sustainable development. And the best way to do that is to have a discussion where some of our key resource persons can share uh, their work, their experiences and the issues that we are challenged and therefore it is not my task to speak but to introduce those speakers. And I will quickly start by introducing our first presenter, Professor Robin Mahon, who is a citizen of Barbados and Jamaica. He's Professor Emeritus Marine Affairs at the Center of Resource Management and Environmental Studies, as we call it in Barbados, CIRMES, University of the West Indies Cable Campus. And before joining CIRMES, he worked with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the FAO and the CARICOM Fisheries Program, the Caribbean Conservation Association as a consultant. His interest and in research on marine resource governance, particularly assessment of governance arrangements for transboundary systems, is well known, and he will therefore, I am sure, share with us significant information. Professor Mahon, you have the floor. And this report, Partnering for a Sustainable Ocean, has concluded that most of the SDG 14 targets can be addressed and achieved at the regional level. So it is really critical that we strengthen that, but while the, the regional clusters, but while we are doing that, we need to see the entire system as a whole and require that at some level uh, there is a, a means of treating with it that way. Okay, enough of that for the moment. I'm going to turn attention quickly to our CARICOM SIDS and the critical importance of ocean and coastal, coastal ecosystems to them. The purpose of this slide is really to, to indicate the diversity of ecosystem services that we depend on. For fisheries, tourism, regulating services such as protection of shoreline, and the fact that oceans are a huge part of our culture, ingrained and, and embedded in our culture on a day-to-day -day basis. 
and these are exposed to many threats which I do not have time to elaborate on, but since you are here at this conference, I'm sure you uh, are very familiar with them. So these, this diversity of services is a challenge that it requires extensive capacity uh, for planning, for research, for information management, implementation and monitoring, regardless of the size of the country. But when the country is small, the challenge is sometimes insurmountable due to the, as it is in, in many CARICOM SIDS, due to the small economies, small public sector, relatively large o ocean space. The typical SIDS challenges. And for this reason, regional approaches are really quite an important way to proceed, but they have their challenges as well. There are the institutional costs, communication problems, difficulties again with getting countries to engage with regional level and access to expertise. And I can say that CARICOM SIDS have been grappling with this regional ocean governance challenge for decades. And what I want to do from there is to give you a quick look at three areas in which CARICOM SIDS have been working and involved uh, to give you a feeling for what is going on in the region. The first one I want to touch on is the Caribbean Sea Initiative, which started way back in 1999 with an Association of Caribbean States resolution to the General Assembly proposing that the Caribbean be a special area within the context of sustainable development. Subsequent to that, and I, the, the history of how the, the idea of a special area was treated with is, is, is a long story, but subsequent to that, uh, in 2007, the ACS established the Caribbean Sea Commission to promote and oversee sustain, sustainable use of the Caribbean Sea. And since then until now, it has been struggling, I think would be a fair way to say, to get on its feet and to adopt that role and, and take its place in the regional ocean governance scenario. In 2008, the resolution transitioned to, towards sustainable development of the Caribbean Sea for present and future generations. And this, the main point of this is that this has been an ongoing, recurrent engagement every two years for nearly two decades, the most recent one being in 2016. The second area I want to focus on is uh, the organization of Eastern Caribbean states, nine small island states, a subset of CARICOM states. And in 2010, their member states mandated the commission to pursue a common policy for oceans. And we have seen a lot of progress since then with the Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy coming on in 2013 the establishment of an OECS ocean governance team, the ocean governance and fisheries unit established within the commission, and attention to the development of national ocean policies. And I believe to date five countries have national ocean policies and others are in progress. So this has happened, this is one of the things that has happened quite rapidly. And finally, the third area I want to talk about is the Global Environment Facility Caribbean Large Marine, e Marine Ecosystem Plus Strategic Action Program, or SAP. And this is for the Caribbean and North Brazil Shelf Large Marine Ecosystems. And again, this started long ago, 1998, and there were two development phases, which were then followed by the first full project phase, which developed a transboundary diagnostic analysis, or analyses, which was then used to develop a strategic action program as a roadmap for improved ocean governance for the period 2015 to 2025. And this has been signed in our region at ministerial level by 25 countries. And the current phase of the project, which is 2015 to 2020, is to implement this strategic action program. And this, this SAP engages all the countries and regional organizations in the region. It is truly a partnering approach. A little more about the SAP. It has six strategies, of which three are focused largely or entirely on regional level governance for shared resources. The other three are focused on specific ecosystem types in a learning by doing mode as pilots. And I just want to emphasize put this up to emphasize that the region, the Caribbean region, has been working on regional level ocean governance steadily for at least the last two decades and probably before. 
So where are the gaps and opportunities? Well, in terms of operational needs, uh, the list is very long. Marine protected areas, uh, UU enforcement, assessment, water quality monitoring, it's a very long list and there's much more uh, that needs to be attended to nationally and regionally. But while we're paying attention to those, because those are most, the more popular areas for funding, we also need to be paying attention to the inst building the institutions that provide the context for those. And I'm talking about regional coordination mechanisms. I'm talking about regional data and information systems, science policy interfaces, national capacity to engage, which is critical because you can have the most the best crafted regional systems and if the countries can't engage you're not going anywhere and so forth. So that's at the CARICOM regional level. At the global level some gaps which are there in my view that need to be filled is that we need a platform for inter-regional learning and exchange among regions. All of the regions listed there and others are doing approaching things in different ways and we need to be able to learn from each other and share information. And I'm wondering if the University Consortium for Small Island States, I wonder how many people have heard of it, uh, is a platform that could take that on. And then we need global level coordination for oceans to facilitate SIDS engagement. We need it to be streamlined so that SIDS can engage. So those are some high points. There's a lot more, but those are some of the key points I want to hit upon. And so I'll just leave you with three key directions for SIDS to pursue, to conclude at the global level, stress the need for global regional ocean governance to be assessed and treated as a whole, and put a mechanism in place to do that. Pursue the development of a platform to connect and foster learning among regions, and within regions, assure that when you undertake operational programs and activities, that they include means of building and contributing to strengthening regional institutional capacity for governance, which they often do not. So I will close there. Thank you very much indeed. What is happening in the Indian Ocean and what the Indian Ocean Commission is all about. In fact, we are a very small commission with uh, apparently we, uh, with a very with uh, five member states, uh, we, amongst which we have, uh, and they are solely island nations. That's Mauritius, Seychelles, Madagascar, the uh, Union of Comoros, which is an archipelago within uh, the Indian Ocean, and we have a French department as well, which is uh, uh, the Reunion Island, which is a French department. So the. Commission has been established since um, 82, and ever since I'm having I'm trying to do this. <laughs> we've been established in 82, and uh, at the same time, um, we have uh, we have been able to. Uh, and in 84, the commission was uh, agreed upon by all the parties through the Victoria Agreement. And ever since, we've been uh, implementing programs uh, related, basically it was related to environment, but then we, the, the scope of the cooperation opened up uh, to take on board other um, uh, dimensions as well, such as uh, health, uh, maritime security, and um, agriculture, and all the other sectors started coming in. And, every, and now we've just been given the mandate by the organization to start working on uh, um, to start working on maritime crime as well. So you could see the um, but the core of the work that we have been doing has been uh, basically within the environmental uh, field and most of, of which has been in the coastal marine and coastal area. So I'll just move to the other side. Since the creation of the IOC, our very first program that was implemented in the region was a regional tuna fishing program. That was way back in the 80s. And uh, uh, that was really one of the, the areas where the countries of that region felt that uh, the, main, the, the main sector into which um, the economy of the of the of these countries rely on was the fisheries. So this is when 
the first program was implemented. And, and everything that we've been doing so far, we believe, has been contributing to, towards the base for the ocean, for, for uh, the blue economy development and for ocean governance because we have put a lot of emphasis uh, onto capacity building in the region. So um, what, are, what is guiding us really, we have a regional seas convention, the Nairobi convention, which was, uh, which came into force as uh, early as uh, the mid 80s. And within that, uh, uh, that protocol, we have uh, a three, uh, within that uh, convention, we have three protocols. And these protocols, other countries of the region of the Western Indian Ocean, including the coastal countries of, West, of East Africa, they've sat, they are um, party to this convention, and the convention meets uh, once every two years. Uh, the COP of the convention is once every two years. So this is when we relook at all the, um, the work that, is, uh, that are being done. And the three, pro the three protocols that are there, uh, the, um, uh, they are protocols to do uh, related to uh, uh, to ecosystem, to the flora and the fauna of the of the region, and uh, there is um, some an uh, agreement as well on uh, marine pollution, a protocol on marine pollution, which was developed with with the uh, with the assistance of UNEP and the IMO, and the third, and now we are in the process of developing the uh, a fourth protocol, which will be the integrated coastal zone management protocol for the region. Um, in the IUU fishing, in, uh, there is a, a general um, a mutual agreement between the countries of the region. It started off with, this, with the island states, but then we, might, we had to extend as well to the countries of, the, of East Africa because uh, the, the region is so vast and that the activities of fisheries are really uh, between uh, the, the various countries, so we had to extend that uh, agreement to, uh, to East Af Africa as well. We have a regional agreement uh, for marine pollution, and this, uh, again, it is uh, not only with the islands of the region, but we also extended it as far as, as South Africa. And we've been able, within that, uh, uh, under this uh, agreement, we've been able to, to set up two uh, centers that, uh, um, that will act as response centers in the event of maritime pollution. We have a center in Madagascar, and uh, another center in South Africa, which is still in the making, but there is a general consensus that the, the, the center will be in South Africa. We, um, as uh, um, lately in uh, uh, last year, in 2016, because of the growing incidence of, uh, uh, of piracy in the region and in a lot of uh, traffic, uh, uh, maritime traffic, intensive maritime traffic, the countries of the region, they agreed to, uh, to work on a program for uh, surveillance and uh, maritime security. And uh, they, this is an interesting uh, uh, um, declaration because it, take, it controls not only the, the coastal countries, but it also, uh, there are also inland countries that abided to this uh, agreement because they feel that you cannot fight piracy only at sea, but you have also to look at the source of the piracy, which could be inland as well. So this is when the countries decided to go for a bigger uh, the, uh, um, arrangement. And then most of what we are doing as well is in line in terms of sur uh, surveillance and maritime security, is in line with the African Union strategy, because our countries are also members of the African Union. So they are working uh, within uh, uh, the framework of the African Union. Some of the programs that we have been implementing that have been uh, baseline support to, um, uh, to, to the uh, ocean governance. So we have uh, quite a bit of programs in uh, uh, biodiversity, uh, trying to harmonize uh, legislations and getting uh, um, the, uh, working with the non-state actors. We have developed quite a bit of programs in coastal zone management, the marine highway and coastal pollution. A contamination program it is to do with uh, uh, with marine pollution and uh, recently the, the the Nairobi Convention has come with a Western Indian Ocean Strategic Action Plan, which uh, which will serve now as the basis for the development of uh, of the ocean governance. In fisheries, a number of programs have been implemented in the region, and this is also to do with um, this is also in, in partnership with. Uh, 
uh, with um, FAO, and those are some of the programs that we have been doing. These are the challenges in the region, piracy. We have uh, EEZ delimitation uh, problems. We have exploration of oil and gases, which is coming up very, uh, very fast. Increasing traffic, climate is an issue. Um, uh, human and financial capacity, research and in innovation. So we have opportunities as well for, to strengthen regional and inter-regional cooperation and uh, involvement, uh, getting uh, uh, institutions uh, networking and sharing of, exper of experience and some of the areas where I think there, there's a need for collaboration. <coughs> so this is all I have for you in a very quick. Uh, thank you very much. That historic or even ex existential relationship, not only as an anchor of Pacific livelihoods, but also critically the custodial duty that we must that we must have and we do have over our ocean. And it is in this context that we continue to deploy our best efforts at finding common ground on effective management frameworks. We therefore see SDG 14 as an opportunity to further embed a strengthened regional ocean governance to ensure effective implementation of goal 14 but more critically to use the current international dialogue on the world's oceans to progress an already ambitious regional agenda for us and for our very sizable chunk of the Pacific Ocean that we have stewardship and custody of. We trust that this first ocean conference is such an opportunity to pursue and solidify these efforts and to share best practices between our regions, which should and must continue intercessionally and for years and for decades to come. I thank you, Chair. I thank the three presenters representing our three regions, the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, for sharing their respective situations, challenges and opportunities faced in our oceans the actions taken to date and suggestions for the way forward. And as you would have heard in the introduction, we will have a partnership um, announced and therefore I call on Mr. Patrick DeBells, United Nations Office for Project Services. In the, um, he's the regional coordinator of the five-year UNDP Jeff CLME Plus project. He has previously worked as a researcher and project coordinator at universities in Belgium and several countries in Latin America and as a consultant for UNDP, UN ECLAT, the World Bank and the International Water Management. Um, with CLME Plus we now come to a stage where we are able to announce an important milestone which is about to be met and that is the launch of a global CLME Plus partnership. Um, but before doing so, I do believe I owe some participants a brief introduction into what CLME Plus actually stands for. Um, here already you can see three, um, three acronyms or three concepts. CLME Plus stands for a Strategic Action Program for Sustainable Management of Marine Resources, a 10-year action program. The implementation of this action program is now being supported by many projects, one of those projects having a central role, a catalytic role, and that is the five-year CLME Plus project. But recognizing that this partnership, that this uh, action program is so ambitious, we definitely need many, many stakeholders and many projects to work together. And that's why we have to establish this CLME Plus partnership and alliance. But CLME Plus itself then actually stands for a region. It's the combined area of the Caribbean and North Brazil shelf large marine ecosystems. 4.4 million square kilometers, an area, a marine space shared by 26 countries, 18 overseas territories, 22 of them being SITs. Extremely complex, all sharing the same marine environment, the same marine resources, the same marine problems. So we definitely need to bring these countries together. And we've managed to do that by making use of existing regional governance bodies, bringing them all together so that they can harvest from the countries what are the true problems, what should be the priority actions that are to be undertaken to achieve sustainable ocean governance, to achieve sustainable management of the marine resources. All of these organizations together with the countries have been able to pull together in 2014, I believe it was, a 10-year strategic action program. This action program has been endorsed by 35 ministers to date, representing 25 countries 
six overseas territories. A huge achievement. Um, the Strategic Action Program, or SAP as we call it, 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 uh, it works towards establishing a long-term vision for the Caribbean region, a vision of a healthy marine environment that provides benefits and livelihoods for the well-being of the people. Um, it, it wishes to drive, through enhanced governance, the development of a sustainable oceans-based economy for the well-being of the people of the region. And um, how is this actually going to happen? Well, we need to make use of the different motors, the different organizations that we already have in the region. If you look, first of all, um, achievement of this ocean-based economy development needs to happen at the local and at the country level. So we definitely need to work with the many countries of the region. But we need to bring these countries together. How do we do that? Luckily in the region, we already can count on a number of geopolitical sub-regional integration mechanisms. For example, the CARICOM and its subsidiary bodies. But not only the CARICOM, also the Central American Integration System, the OECS, etc., etc. Above these, at the regional level, we can count with the support of a number of both UN intergovernmental organizations as well as intergovernmental organizations native to the region. And then, of course, we have the overarching global framework on which we also have to build and within which context we have to embed our different actions. So what was now the big challenge for the region? It is to make these different elements of what we call a multi-level, integrated, nested governance framework, to make these different elements talk to each other, to better coordinate and collaborate on joint action. We now have this five-year project, which is helping us actually implementing this strategic action program. And with the support of the project, we are now about to launch the Global Partnership for the Sustainable Management, Use and Protection of the CLME Plus region, which is actually an important instrument to help the countries of the region to move forward towards the different targets under the Sustainable Development Goal 14. First stepping stone is the establishment of an interim coordination mechanism, which is going to be established this week through the signing of a memorandum of understanding by eight of the key regional governance bodies working on the marine environment in the region, CARICOM being one of them. But making this idea of a sustainable oceans-based economy work cannot be done just by the forces in government and in intergovernment organizations. We need to further expand this partnership and bring on board both civil society and private sector. The concept of integrative ocean governance. It's the whole of interactions among civil, public and private actors taken to solve societal problems. And not just about, it's not just about solving problems. It's also about creating societal opportunities so that we can indeed materialize that idea of sustainable ocean-based growth. So the, um, the mechanism that we're now about to launch, this week we would have the signing of the agreement among the eight organizations which are at the core of this three-tiered uh, mechanism. The core membership, the interim coordination mechanism consisting of intergovernmental organizations together with the countries that have endorsed the CLME Plus action program. Around that, we will have a strong partnership with key NGOs, key representatives from private sector, development banks, the donor community. These organizations will be sitting on what we call the CLME Plus partnership. The idea is that those members of the partnership will establish strong coordination and interaction with the intergovernmental organizations in the countries. But then we also know that we will definitely need to build upon the efforts of all those stakeholders out there with whom maybe we will not be able to coordinate our day-to-day -day activities, but who are definitely willing to subscribe to this long-term vision that we have for the region. And that is the CLME Plus Alliance. CLME Plus Alliance would require stakeholders from different sectors of society to make a pledge. They would be required to subscribe to the long-term vision for the region that we all share. They would need to make a commitment to contribute, to help us with the implementation of the strategic action program, and we would kindly request them to uh, subscribe to certain principles of sound uh, marine resources management. We truly think now that we are uh, really achieving a milestone in this region where we are really bringing these different forces together. 
so that through the CLME Plus project, we can definitely speed up and catalyze the implementation of the action program, and through that, help the region to achieve the different targets under both the agenda for sustainable development, but also other international initiatives, such as, for example, the CBD strategic action plan, and any international commitments that are also being made, for example, in the context of sustainable fisheries. This was, uh, relatively briefly, the announcement I wanted to make today. Of course, we definitely need to start tracking progress. Huh? And that's why also through the CLME Plus project and partnership, we will be launching a mechanism to periodically report on the state of the marine ecosystems in the region. But we do not just want to report on the state of the marine ecosystems. We want to show the importance of the marine ecosystems for the economies of the region. And that's why this report needs to show how the marine assets that we have in the region are contributing to the economies and how they can further contribute to enhanced economies and what we would need to do in that context in terms of protecting our marine environment. And hereby, I thank you very much for your attention. I look very much forward to working with all of you. I also thank you very much for your comprehensive presentation. I look around the room and I see a number of key stakeholders here.